the Grey Hat Beard podcast. Hello and welcome to show 17 of Grey Hat Beard, the modern workplace podcast where we talk about all things modern workplace in the world of Microsoft 365. I'm Grey, my name's Kevin McDonnell, I'm a solutions architect at CPS, want to be MVP and generally tired and fed up of rubbish two weeks camping in the Isle of Wight with six weather warnings. Last grumble I will make about that, I promise, I know these guys have heard that a lot, but uh, that's me. <laughs> I'm Alan Erdley, Solution Architect at CPS, uh, Office Apps MVP uh, and co-organiser of the London uh, Power Apps User Group. Cool. Um, my name is Gary Trinder, I am The Beard. Um, I'm also a Solutions Architect at CPS, um, an Office Development MVP, member of the PNP team as well and uh, co-organiser of the Leeds User Group. You two have never mentioned those ones before, and that's quite a good one and should highlight it more. Um, and, and thank you both for your, your coordinating Gary's hat and, uh, sorry, Gary's t-shirt and Al's uh, hat there. So those watching on YouTube, lots of coordination going on today. This is the first time we're all back together since July the 15th, which is uh, quite a struggle. So uh, apologies if we... Uh, a little bit out of practice with any of these things. We, we took a much needed break um, and now we're back and raring to go. So we're going to kick off in the first half with some news and the latest thing that happens. We have four weeks of news to cover, so we try and get into that as quickly as we can. <laughs> and then in the second half, we're going to talk a bit about roadmaps and how to stay on top of what's what comes out and what's going to be announced with Microsoft 365 with a big view to Ignite coming up um, tw was it 21st to 23rd of September it was 22nd to 24th. 22nd to 24th. Yeah. And, registra and registration is open at the moment. That's another thing we should put in the links. It's uh, uh, a good point. So we'll put a link to that. We're going to be talking a little bit about what we're hoping to see, what, what we think we'll see and what we really like to uh, have come out as well. Um, but that will be in part two. In part one, we're going to crack on with some news and what we've been up to. Um, now, we didn't discuss who's going to go first, but uh, maybe Al, do you want to kick off what you've been up to and uh, share your little bit of news there? Oh, what have I been up to? Um, I haven't been off for two weeks. I've been up to uh, reading emails and trying to get on top of all of the things that were taking place over two weeks. So, uh, yes, and it being um, the start of the new academic year and having a couple of education clients who are uh, frantically trying to get everything in place. So that's that's work wise. Um, tech wise. Well, I'm still trying to get back onto Twitter and, and actually find the time to actually just get back with everything and, and get on top of everything. But there are a few things that have caught my eye. Um, so one in particular is Project Mocker. So I did see that that, that had been, uh, there was a blog post about that. Um, and it's one of those things that it's, it brings together lots of tools and technology um, in one place. Um, and being a big fan of to-do and productivity. It, 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 sorry, just a, a a quick summary of what Mocker is. I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen, but for the, those who may not have seen it. Uh, it just seems to be a place where you can actually surface notes, you can surface um, your tasks, your meetings, bring it together a personalised view of the information that you are using to manage your time and your activities. Um, as you can see in the view, it's it's got lots of different things in there. Um, it kind of feels a bit like a you know, what would have been an old intranet homepage that's been personalized <laughs> to you. Um, but it's all to do with with Microsoft 365 and the tools and the, um, the activities that you have within there. It, it looks to me a bit like a structured whiteboard almost. Mm. Um, you know, you've got that ability to have ta uh, tasks and, um, you know, uh, post-it notes and things like that. Um, yeah, and it's got some weird terminology. It's got project plan in there. Which just just amused me. So, I, I so have to be this, honest. This I, kicked off in, internally at CPS some debates. It was like, well, hang on, now we've got project for the web. We've got to dos all over the place. Now we've got this as somewhere else. And I was kind of, like, I I don't see this as a, a kind of formal place that much. It's a kind of nice, easy to use, as you say, somewhere where you'd maybe like your desktop you have on your PC or a whiteboard where you pin a few things or maybe a pin board in a project team. I think it's a, a virtual version of that. So uh, be, be yeah, interesting it, how it evolves. It's 
it will be because you know with changes like to do coming into teams you know this is where the focus has been trying to get things into teams and then all of a sudden you've got this left field thing come in and go here's a different place to go well wait a second why do i I need to go to a different place i guess there's no reason you couldn't pin this within a teams tab itself you know it's it's all on the web so you you could have the same thing there I'll, um, I will reserve yet, so don't do that but uh, yeah i will reserve i will reserve judgment until i see it i mean certainly looking at it 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 doesn't look for me at the moment to have the capabilities that would make me want to use it um i know it's i think it's it will confuse people yeah i, I agree um, Sorry, Gary, cool. no, I agree. I think the fact that it's um, based in Outlook for the web as well, it's like, you know, Teams is is always marketed as this single place to go. Now it's, oh, you're in your email and you can go to this completely other place and different place and, and see things in a slightly different way. And they're not quite joined up because it's, it'll be based on, on Outlook. I'm um, just looking at kind of the features of like links and contacts and you know, more emails. It's like, okay is this to kind of bridge a gap for people who are not so keen to move directly to teams and still people want to stay in outlook but i mean i use outlook for the web but i I think i'm in maybe a minority there i think there's more people using it but still you know in a lot of organizations you've just got people using the 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 normal desktop client so will they ever see this um as well i think I think it's interesting because we have talked about this a bit before when it was kind of leaked and there was a, a Twitter user called Walking Cat who uh, managed to find it and uh, shared it out and showed you how you could get access to it. It was called Outlook Spaces at the time. Uh, in, interestingly, that Twitter user was suspended last week and it's just been reactivated and I, I missed whatever it was that uh, caused them to be suspended, sadly. So uh, interesting news uh, there if you, if you do want to hunt that down somewhere. I, I think for me... I, I, I get there on talking about the Outlook, and I'm, I'm not sure how many people will jump in and use that there. But this looks like where Delve, you had the pinned board, which I absolutely love, but never really took off. It feels like that plus a bit more. So I, I would like to see this take off, but I, I've definitely got the healthy cynicism you two both have around it as well. Yeah, that, yeah. that point you've just made, that, um, uh, Kev, the, the, the boards, I completely get that because I think that was a missed opportunity in, mm-hmm. in Delve, uh, definitely. Um, yeah. And I think as I'm looking at this more, I can see it It feels more like my own space rather than a space that I'd share with other people. So, you know, where I might actually have a physical board in my room with post-its and all kind of bits and pieces in there. And maybe this is yeah. just the, the virtual version of that yeah. for my own personal use. And I, and I like from that preview, it's added a lot more things than that so things like you're adding your goal onto there so setting yourself some targets and having them nice and visible um and i think this is the thing is whether it's whether it's personal or team you know if it's if it's personal then yes it might have it might have a place but if it's team i can't see it really taking place effectively yeah. as a team collaboration space yeah no, I think that's it's true. So interesting stuff. Thanks, Al. Um, I'll, I'll go on to I, I know we've got in the notes lots of uh, bits of news ed- against me. I got overexcited uh, uh, picking up these. So I've, I've again been on holiday. Uh, I said I won't talk about that again, so I certainly won't. Um, Sorry, where did you go? How was the weather? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the six weather warnings six weather warnings was it meant to be in france okay no i'm not going to talk about that anymore um it, but yeah four weeks of news so so lots of stuff coming up uh one the interesting one we were kind of talking about teams and having things on there was uh, the fact that kpmg managed to delete their entire chat history for teams they the, the entire personal chat history on uh, their internal conversations between people. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's personal history. You would you would have thought that it wouldn't matter quite so much, and uh, people should clear those down. All the chat should go into into the channels and things like that. But I think we all know that in reality, that doesn't happen, and and people do have huge amounts of kind of having that personal, that one to one. You add other people in there. Um, if that's all gone, I would imagine there's a huge amount of information being lost with that. Off the back of that, an awful lot sorry, of information. An awful lot. I think an awful lot of information will have been lost with that. Um, and I think it's 
you know, I've got many clients who kind of look at it. Well, how how do we manage the chats? You know, and in particular, if I have a, a freedom of information request or a subject access request, how do I find out, you know, what people have been saying about other people? That's one of the reasons that people tend to look at removing some of the chat. But I think that the key thing about this this one is somebody's tested it partially, not tested it properly and then gone right i'm just going to run this now and it's it's not had the desired outcome and for me rather than the reason why it's actually that well how do you test these things to get this working when you're changing a a setting like this at tenant level and especially when you've got 145,000 users and why do you not have a backup strategy in place uh you know as no one tested that being restored etc cetera, etc cetera. it's uh absolutely the, it's uh, the, 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 i, I would have thought question is can you actually back it up absolutely can you do you have a rollback process for this yeah mm. uh, are the apis available for you to do that as well that's that's one thing which i think you know there there are lots of backup services out there but they're not everything's covered um so there's certain areas that you know you really need to look into but it was interesting on that that it was oh we're going to apply this policy to a single account and manage to do the whole tenant um yeah oops <laughs> Oops, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, there's we, there's warnings. There. There's warnings I, I there. The three of us. I, I think the three of us have been lucky that, thankfully, that hasn't got into the press with any mistakes so far. But uh, <laughs> I can imagine it's quite easy to do. So um, let's move on quickly before yes. someone else takes it. I thought. What, what was interesting is a, a follow to that. Joanne Klein uh, posted uh, yesterday on, on Twitter a, a little poll that was, uh, no, not that one, uh, a little poll that was around short deletion policies. So whereas KPMG had the mistake, they accidentally deleted everyone's private chat. There are quite a few people, it seems. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to say no to that one and just see. Oh, I'm not logged in, so I can't there. Um, uh, we'll try and have a look at the uh, that and see how many there are. But uh, there are a lot of people that delete those private chats automatically. Uh, and Tom Arbuthnot, uh, I suddenly realised I don't know how to pronounce his name as I've said that, so I hope that's right. Sorry, Tom, if you're listening. Um, but he say, sees quite a lot of this in, in large organisations, that they do actively delete those chats mm. uh, on there. And uh, I can't see it. But he followed up with saying a lot of it is around kind of freedom of information acts, people wanting to get rid of that. If if you've got that content held somewhere, then you're legally obliged to share it if there's a request yep. for it. If you haven't got it, then you haven't got it. And people are a lot more chatty in personal chats and maybe saying things they shouldn't do on there. And I think that's quite an interesting debate. You know, sh should you say, well, it, on the off chance people are doing stuff that's wrong, uh, then we should delete it versus if people are doing something wrong, maybe we should make sure they're not doing something wrong. Very, very interesting conversation and it's, thoughts we had around that. It's an interesting one because it's easier to search email than it is to search chat. And I think that's one of the things that definitely comes up is, you know, if I know that chat is actually not as easy to search then maybe i'll have a conversation in there rather than email which i know is being audited and logged and you know recorded mm. so yeah it's it's kind of that not shadow it but kind of working around working around the um the expectations yeah um, now gary's being very formal has put his hand up here which uh, I've, I've never seen us do before so it was obviously right? being more formal did, while we've been away did you notice that there was actually when he put his hand up it was actually more of an emphasis and it's it highlighted that whole screen that yeah, whole window it's, yeah it's taken something from zoom where it go there you are this is the person speaking and things yep if you put your hand up now you get a nice little glow around you so everyone can see so um, I, we will try not to witter about this too much but yes and see if that shows up in the recording as well um right, guys you can put your hands down now <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things is um, obviously using personal chat. Um, a lot of people don't know, they still don't make the distinction between the personal chat, group chats, and then Teams chats. Mm -hmm. So if you know if you've got them policies and you want to go back to a conversation that you had one to one basis, you might not actually be able to get a record of you making a decision. Um, you know, if you've got those policies in place, then it's educating people to make sure that if you're not using email, then make the decision in the team. 
um, in the conversations because then that will be there and there'll be different policies around that. Um, but that's from an adoption point of view. Uh, again, something that would need to be, uh, um, well, make everyone aware of that because uh, I can see that, you know, by turning those policies on, you could cause yourself yeah. some some other issues. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think you're right there because there are multiple different types of chat as well. Because there is the 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 one to one, the group chat, you know, where you can have multiple peer to peer. Then there's the the chat that we've got against a meeting, the chats against a channel. Um, it's there's quite a few variations, and they all have the same name. Mm. And so therefore, it's uh, again one of those confusing confusing areas where you kind of go, well, are we talking about posts or chat or what are conversations? What are we talking about now? Absolutely. Um, some other bits of news and I think this might be my favorite bit of news ever Microsoft 365 apps say farewell to Internet Explorer 11 and I just think that's the best news Yay. I think Edge as well that you know the, the legacy edge we're obviously keeping the Chromium version the legacy edge I don't think that was as bad as people made out but I'm not too sad to see that go but I'm very happy to see that we no longer have to support IE 11 um, from a user point of view, it's been horrific and uh, we'll love to see that go. I'm sure there's many IT teams out there thinking how on earth they're going to get that done in time. Um, and and I don't blame you. I think that will be painful. But I think there's even more developers who are sitting there thinking, yes, no more polyfill, no more awkward testing of multiple different browsers. I think if you're testing in the uh, in Credge, uh, then you've got Chrome covered pretty much as well. I, I don't think you need to do quite so much testing as different things. It will be easier. It will work better. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Microsoft, for this news. You think yeah. um, this will actually push more organizations to increase the rate that they upgrade to Windows 10? interesting one yeah possibly there's, there's uh, certainly still a lot of organizations out there who are uh, in the process of upgrading yeah um, and browsers is one of the i think one of the key things that they're now looking at is to say you know once 17th of august 2021 comes along and microsoft 365 stops supporting ie 11 well actually that's going to be when you're going to be really wanting to be on windows 10 and have the proper version of edge as well as a default yeah it's interesting because microsoft did say recently that they were going to have a kind of two-year cycle for announcements and and look at that that's that's not that's one year it's quite a quite it's a painful a, um timeline impressive. so whether they've looked at analytics and they're just not seeing people use it uh, i don't know but so one of the things that that might be uh that might have shortened this is because in the chromium edge there's the um legacy mode so by the the microsoft are wanting people to move to the new edge so that and then use that new feature rather than staying with i11 which you know it's a lot if you've got an, uh, an application that you've just not been able to upgrade and it's still you know business critical those are the things that you're going to need a path to 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 keep that going um almost because you know you're not gonna be able to turn that around quickly mm -hmm. enough um, within this announcement but there's a path forward and then you're getting everyone onto a single browser it's then more fitting for modern web I mean ie is just it's it's holding things back again like it was with the previous versions yeah. um, one uh, project PMPJS dropped support for ie 11 um, they added polyfills but it was just so painful um, they it was just no nope, the new version we're, we're not going to support i11 and obviously people were a bit upset but you have to move forward you've got to crack a few eggs haven't you so to speak um but um yeah i mean, but I mean the, the the problem is i think there are so many enterprise apps and it's amazing how long these stick around for uh, and you talk about that legacy mode it's still all going to be tested so um it, it will be interesting to see if there's any backtrack from that date uh i, I we've obviously seen some backtrack the coronavirus related with things like the uh, SharePoint 2010 moving back to March um, and other bits on like that be interesting to see if there is an outcry from organizations who have pretty big sway may, may not appear on Twitter so much I think on on Twitter and certainly now our bubbles will see most people going yes hallelujah but when it comes to enterprises I think there may be a slightly different discussion so I uh, hope not but uh, be interesting to see absolutely I think certainly uh when it comes to public sector 
there are areas and there will always be pockets mm -hmm. that have uh, have dependency on on hold up tech but also they just have so many people to upgrade it takes a long time yeah but yeah. I, I also think the um public sector and large organizations generally uh, as well so, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah the key will be when the when when we get to the teams um like kind of deadline if you like where it stops yeah. supporting in teams yeah. that's when you'll see the most um you know fury because everyone's using teams now really for working from home so that's going to cause the most pain first of all and then i guess they'll see well, what everybody everybody you say everybody's using teams there's still a lot of organizations who oh. are still <laughs> i mean we we all three of us know you know based on the clients that we're working with they're still working to start using teams but i think this sort of announcement will help so that they don't have, you know, like the default browser of IE11. I've got one client, very large, and the default browser is IE11. So all notifications from Outlook, you click on a link to Planner, it opens in IE11, and then it, it isn't as functional. So mm -hmm. this this will accelerate some of that, I think. No, I think it'd be good. Um, other news, slightly depressing, but I, I think positive what's trying to come from it. Um, Louise Freeze has been putting a campaign over the last week or so to highlight the the kind of toxic messages that she receives as uh, direct messages in Twitter, her, her DMs, things like, hello, gorgeous, you look so delicious. Hello, this is my number. Call me after 10 p.m. And, and just really trying to highlight and say, be loud and shout against this. And she, she also put another tweet about this is saying, hey, hey, blokes out there, why haven't you retweeted this? Uh, which I think has, has given many people, including myself, um, thought to say, no, let, let's retweet it. Let's, let's not just have people affected by this saying it's bad. Let's all shout out against this. Uh, and I think it is one of the downsides to technology. It is currently a very male dominated routine. I think there's lots of work going on to make sure conferences have equal um, equal participation, equal speaking from um, male and female and getting representation. I think there's so much good work to try and push this um, to see it undone by the way that people behave on Twitter, whether they don't think it's real, whether they do the same in real life, uh, you think not. So um, I, I'd like to stand and yeah, say that, please, th this is not right behaviour to message people inappropriately. Think about what you're saying on there. And so, yeah, I, I will add my voice to this and say, please don't. It's horrific. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of a sad state of affairs because previous to Louise putting this this tweet out as well, I've seen a lot of other instances of this happening um, just in general in in just the technology world. There's there's mm -hmm. been a few instances recently where um, you know people who are in um, developer relations roles who are kind of you know there trying to help other people that are you know kind of getting remarks that are just completely inappropriate um and you know it, it's 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 horrible it it does happen i think that we've had a lots of discussions within pmp around this as well in that pmp and sharepoint it's a fairly good space we don't have a lot of this go on um but when things do you know when things do happen we also need to react in in the right way and supporting louise um you know with with what she's saying and and, and is you know making people yeah making people aware that this thing this does happen uh, even if it doesn't affect you it doesn't mean it's not going on um and that yeah we need to come together and and, and basically make sure that we're we're you know approaching it in in the right way making sure that that people are not doing this really and keeping the message going um yeah. as well um not just a oh this happened and then we all just disappear and forget about it because there's something new to talk about um it needs to be there and be front and center um and you know making sure that we build safe communities um on, online really um but yeah it's it's terrible it, it is and it's it but it's one of those things that is you know, Louise has a community that she can speak to who will support her um, and, you know, we can all support her in, in making it clear that this is unacceptable. But when it comes down to it, you know, you think, well, actually, you know, I have a daughter. She's about to 
start going to university and well studying for a levels and stuff like that and it's all it's life that is um, painful here you know it's not just technology and it's not just twitter it's all social media and it's all you know the general approach that society has so highlighting it promoting the good ways of actually working uh and good yeah. ways of interacting is is absolutely crucial and you know it does make me think you know my daughter was on twitter how how would she cope with this you know we know louise is strong we know louise is is able to cope with this but there's many many out there who will see this as um if they experience it firsthand it will put them off it will completely you know it will have very damaging effects on people i, I would i want to pick up on something you said there that i think of, of making the positive come through uh, and i like that this story hasn't turned into let's let's name and shame those people who've done it and have that kind of attack and turn it around the other way i don't think that we're talking about we're trying to say to people don't do this let's not go attacking the other people in the same way let's just say let's just highlight that this is wrong yeah. so uh, so yeah lending our voice to that um one one last little bit of news very small one because uh I, I this amused me when i saw it uh i i've chatted with gary about stickers on laptops uh quite a bit uh, and i know louise and elio have a a company about stickers uh, and they actually made one just for gary uh of getting a sticker called i hate stickers uh, I i'm actually thinking honest. about ordering one of these just to uh, stick all over gary um as, as much as possible <laughs> kind of can't cover it's a shame we don't have desks anymore but uh i think ordering an i hate stickers sticker um will be the future so that that, that gave me a good giggle when i got back from holiday that one <laughs> Yeah, that was incredibly quick. Um, I actually sent them. Um, it was just within a in, in a friendly chat of just like I don't like stickers, um, and with literally within seconds, Elio had already got it over Twitter. Um, <laughs> so yeah, kudos. You can obviously get your stickers designed very quickly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I did have a laugh as well. Yeah, so I, I think a shout out for Elio and Louise for their um, what's it, pimp your own device uh, site. We're not getting out to conferences. There are not so many stickers. If you've got a new device over the summer, uh, have a look at there and uh, get, get some of your own stickers going from there until uh, we get back to conferences. Uh, but Gary, uh, over to you and your, your stickerless devices. What are you uh, to? Yeah, my nice, shiny, clean devices, which I'd, uh, I like that way. Um, yeah, so um, I've not been on holiday, um, so I have been slaving away at work, um, you know, building awesome things in Microsoft 365. Um, but um, I've actually been uh, quite ahead in open source as well, so I've been really busy uh, getting ready for the V3 launch of CLI for Microsoft 365, uh, which is the new name for Office 365 CLI. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work on that, um, releasing that this weekend. Um, but that means I've been kind of looking in open source world and there's a couple of things that have uh, caught the eye. Um, so the first thing is Microsoft have revamped their open source site. Um, so if you're not aware of this, uh, Microsoft do have um, an area where they promote and support open source initiatives. Um, and these might be uh, Microsoft initiatives, they might be uh, just, you know, uh, people who are working in the Microsoft space, uh, developers who have, um, uh, projects out in the open and um, so again it's there to just kind of show awareness that you know Microsoft are the biggest contributor to GitHub um, out of all the companies in the world you know this is another example well, of yeah, they own it but... <laughs> well they, they do own it but they still every they they contribute more even, than yeah, the Googles and, and Amazons um, of this world so yes they do own it but still <laughs> um, they um, they did really ramp up the usage um, but yeah so if you want to get involved in open source projects you want to look at the open source projects that Microsoft have released Windows Terminal is a perfect example of that I mean, it's a huge well, one you know that for that to be open source is amazing it is and and again it's it's the the new Microsoft yeah. right it's mm. you know um, .NET is open source PowerShell so, is open source PowerShell .NET there's some there's some really big projects in there um, but what I like about this is they have highlighted smaller um, open source projects as well. Um, so um, uh, Image Sharp is is one that um, has been highlighted recently. Wow. It's a single developer. Cool. It's, uh, it's, yeah. yeah, but it's a single developer, um, you know, maintaining that project. It was good to see Microsoft kind of, you know, 
look at the usage there and, and try and help and support um, open source maintainers for these projects that, you know, are, they they do get a lot of usage and um, and it takes a lot to maintain them. Um, and it's not easy if it's, uh, you know, not not your day to day job. You know, this this is people's passions um, mm. um, as well. So any support that uh, people can get, then I'm all for that being a maintainer myself <laughs> i know how it can how difficult it can be and, um, and i think there's been many cases where people are just seeing the negative side of things and people complaining this doesn't work this doesn't do things not kind of treating it like as you say a passion it's a it, they're usually side projects and people often don't treat them like that yeah and i think that's kind of um so uh, i think uh, patrick rogers who's uh, you know the uh, one of the maintainers um of uh, pmpjs who's put a lot of time and effort in there it's a really great tool lots of people use it um and he was kind of uh, saying on twitter about you know the negative effects of trying to look after um a, an open source project if something just doesn't work as expected or there's a feature missing you know go with trying to help create that feature not yeah. you know be negative and saying oh this should have been built in yeah because you might be the only one only person who's actually asked for that yeah. mm -hmm. you've got the ability to ask for it openly help with designing that feature you know you might not have to build it uh, which is which is another thing but you can start the ball rolling and if you get make that visible other people then might kind of join your cause and then it, it becomes more of a okay rather than me building this feature for just one person in their use case it's actually no this is going to have a wider benefit to to everyone who uses this um uh, this this project um and then you know the, the actual effort that you have to go through designing making sure you're going through um uh, writing the code making sure the code is a a particular quality to put in and then release to the thousands of people who use it um you know that all takes time um so yeah completely get get where he's coming from um and there are also all the benefits that we've discussed in the past about you know learning from other people who are working in that same project yeah it going down on your cv you know a lot of organizations will take to that really well so there's there's all those personal benefits for actually being positively involved rather than just saying actually there's there's something missing there's something not working i see lots of people pr probably a lot in facebook groups and then some of the um, forums saying i want to get a job doing sharepoint online but i've got no experience how to get involved this yeah. is how you get involved and i always try and reply to people say look at one of these projects try and help out with those don't need to be technical you could be helping it could be like gary just helping out with maintaining it so um um they, you missed that dig there. Um, <laughs> you can pick up all the bits there. And um, just on the back of that open source and, and with Microsoft, as you say, trumpeting the the great participation in, in the community with open source, I, I thought it was another interesting one that the uh, Azure Twitter account put out. Um, but they recognised Gregor Suti. I've, I've met Gregor a couple of times in uh, uh, some of the London Ignite events. And he basically over three years has taught himself as you he's he's gone, tweeted and blogged the journey. He's gone through all the different certifications and I, I love what Gregor's done. I think he's been amazing at sharing all he's learned. He's just got a new job um, doing pure Azure, which is great. And I love the fact that the Azure account actually went in there and said, you know, they had a very nice video of his history over the last three years and the conversations he'd had with them and highlighting that. So uh, I thought it was a lovely, lovely small thing for Microsoft there. Mm. Um, Gary, you, uh, you have one other bit of news, I think. <laughs> You've forgotten already. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the, the, the quite one. Yeah, so um, it was a while ago now, actually, at uh, the GitHub Satellite Conference, um, GitHub announced code spaces um, so that you could go to a repository and uh, basically spin that project up in a... a virtual environment just within the browser um so i was lucky enough to get in the preview so i played around with it um at the weekend and it's brilliant instead of having <laughs> to download the code to your own machine That's get all so the dependencies intense. just click the button opening code spaces i had you know it was it was brilliant obviously working on the cli i spun up an environment in literally minutes just waiting for it to kind of provision it installed all of the dependencies for me it i've got all the terminals there i can basically start running and building um the the code um you know i can uh, push my um uh, branches to my own repository 
but it was brilliant that it was just that Visual Studio Code inter interface. And for me, being able to use that um, is, is great because I've got a, a dev environment that I don't have to look after. The next step, and, and this is where it's, it's, it's going to head, is as a maintainer, we can create our own dedicated environments for you to use. So if, for example, we have particular tooling, uh, we might have LinkedIn tools that we want to use uh, to make sure that you know, using the correct amount of spaces and, and, and class names, and all that kind of stuff. We can add that into an image that you can then use. So it really does that onboarding process of getting new developers on there. It just, again, reducing that friction mm. down to a button click. Um, one one of the great. things I found with Visual Studio Code Spaces was it sometimes felt a bit slow, you know, getting getting started and thing. Is it similar with GitHub or is it any quicker? So there's there's a little delay when it's initially doing that that build and that startup, but we're we're, we're talking like minutes. It, it wasn't long at, at all to 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 build when I was actually in um, Code Spaces and writing code. I actually mm. did some tests against my own machine and what was running in Code uh, Spaces as well. Um, and it, we were talking like tenths of a second, basically difference. It, it, it was uh, but for the CLI, obviously that's Node.js based. It might yeah. be different for the for the languages, but it, it wasn't noticeably slower, which was good. And that that's again that experience. You know, developer experience has to be there. You don't want to be waiting around all the time. Um, I think it'd be, be good to come back in a couple of weeks and just see uh, see if you're still using it and see how you feel then. Yeah, and um, see, what, yeah. see what happens when more people start using it as well, as opposed to it being <laughs> a private preview. <laughs> there, there is that, yes. You can nominate um, anyone, you know, do, do you <laughs> no, maybe not Al doesn't do Dev anymore. No, don't, don't nominate me. <laughs> But it, but it was one okay. thing was, was pretty cool is I put a quick web app together and, and having that um, basically running in code spaces and I was basically able to look at look at this website that was running locally within code spaces through a through like a tunnel. Um, mm. So that was really that was really cool. That worked really well. Um, so, you know, for web based um, development, it, it works as well, um, which was cool. Right, we're massively overrunning, so I'm going to try and rattle through these uh, very quickly. Al, you, you had a nice post. We were just chatting in the intro about uh, meeting chat in Teams. Yeah, this is one that came up came up from a client question quite a while back, um, and it's to do with how you track who can see conversations um, within Teams. So, in particular, this was to do with meetings and when you have an attendee who you've invited, they can see the chat. But what happens when you've got recurring meetings and you have the difference between attendees and a participant? So somebody who's not actually. For example, you invited someone to come and speak at a podcast in a recurring meeting. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Pipe Peter for popping up in the chat at the beginning of this. Yeah. Which, I, uh, trigger the conversation. Yeah. And this, this, so the, I put this together because it was. Um, it was very much around, you know, you've got a recurring meeting, you invite somebody as an attendee, they can still see the chat, the chat, they might not be attending all the meetings, you may have invited them to only one instance, one occurrence of a meeting, but what can you still see um, as part of the chat, because you don't want to have people able to see the chat that's going on for subsequent meetings, if it's a, you know, a board meeting, for example. Yeah. Um, and there were there are some gotchas in there. So, yes, this They're was put really, together really post to, to have a good breed for people, I think. Yeah. And it, it's it's really important because you don't see as a meeting organizer that people are still able yeah. to see things unless you you actually have a look. Or they um, pop up and say hello. Hello again. Or they pop up and say hello. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which is always always nice. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and talking of which, we will have Peter uh, back in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, he obviously spoke about uh, exams and things. We're going to try and pick up the bit we didn't really cover there about security uh, ahead of Teams Fest. So uh, absolutely. looking forward to that. Uh, other posts, uh, I've started a series on, on my blog around knowledge management. So um, particularly there's Cortex and we'll talk about Ignite in a minute. Uh, and I think we're hoping to hear some things around that. But there's lots of things you can do around knowledge management that don't have to involve Cortex, whether it's planning ahead for Cortex coming or whether it's um, you're not going to be able to afford Cortex. Have a read of this series, going to be releasing uh, a few every I, I, 
I'm still not sure either every few weeks or every few days. I'm a little nervous that whatever is announced the Ignite is going to change a lot of what I write on there. So uh, still still to be decided as I release those. But um, keep an eye on that one. I've got a, a few events. Um, Gary, you spoke at the PMP virtual conference last week on managed identity, and I think that should uh, any day now be up on YouTube. So um, we'll check out the PMP channel for that one. Yeah, everything's getting released on Tuesday. So there was uh, two tracks um, on Tuesday um, that, that was run. So anything PMP related, but also the sessions on just architecture, which was which was really good. Uh, some code sessions. Um, uh, they will all get released to the PMP channel on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, I, I managed to catch uh, about three or four of those, uh, including yours, which is very good. Um, and yeah, look, looking forward to being able to catch up on the ones I, I couldn't see, uh, especially the Q&A at the end. Um, we also have Al, you're speaking next Wednesday at the uh, Global Con 3. Global Con 3, yep. Yeah. So uh, why Microsoft to do is good for your mental health. Um, so yeah, that's a, a deep dive into Microsoft to do and how to use it to alleviate the the mental strain that we're all suffering at the moment yeah i'm, I'm a little sad well talking mental strain a little sad that uh, i'm not speaking at global con 3 I've, I've spoken at most of the collab 365 events but decided that i wasn't going to have time and that was going to be the thing that pushed me over the edge so uh, i hope hope to be back for global con 4 uh, and have something there but uh, we'll definitely be watching as many things as i can and what i love about those events i've said this a few times you can join the chat with the speakers at the side oh. because they're pre-recorded but the speakers are pretty much all there so you can chat about it as you go along which is really useful yep i'm going to be speaking at the global microsoft 365 dev boot camp um the the hamburg one although when actually be in hamburg will be a virtual event so unfortunately i won't be able to go and visit the uh, the fish market there which is a, a great place to go if uh, you do get to travel again uh, i'll be speaking on microsoft search and all the the loveliness that you get with that as well and then on uh, i've got here the 7th october for teams fest i thought it was earlier than that but uh Maybe that's my bad memory, but uh, Al, you and I are speaking on the Grey Hat Beard Guide to Entitlements. Absolutely. So how entitled do we feel as podcasters? Is that, is that the topic? Something like that? Uh, something something more security related. So, uh, yes, yes, the, the Azure AD entitlements, how you can grant permissions to multiple different things in one go and then review the, the whole life cycle. Should be a, that should be a good session. It's a really... And, and a I'm going to be public subject. here and say that uh, this is something Al you're pulling together. So uh, you're doing all the hard work, and I'm just uh, riding on your coattails for that Ab one. So, absolutely, yeah. And then public in that. Yeah, and, and Peter will be joining us next week. He's uh, he's moderating the the whole security track for Teams Fest. So um, and he's speaking as well for that. I can't remember right, what yeah. he's speaking on, but he is speaking. I'll, I'll grab in the show notes the the link to that as uh, yes. to both those. So yeah, some some good events coming up, and obviously ignite in a couple of weeks' time, which I think it brings us nicely to wrap up part one uh, and get on to talking about roadmaps and our our thoughts and desires for ignite. So thank you very much. I'm going to remember not to leave the call this time, uh, which I noticed you did in the last one, Al. Uh, I did indeed. That. Thank you for raising that. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, <laughs> we'll finish part one. Thanks very much and see you in part two.